it's always been an auspicious prospect for most children. A new house means new neighbours, a new yard, new friends and a new school. A new house for a boy of nine means a new adventure. Well, at least until one has settled in. My parents and I decided to move due to a few contentious issues that had arisen in our previous town. More precisely, I would begun to fight with the other children. Each time I would be sent to detention, my parents would then be called, and I would give a disingenuous excuse as to why I would started it in the first place. Every time was akin to acting out a scene from a script. Each line would be repeated on cue, and each time I would be grounded accordingly. I must concede that at the time I had no real reason for my behaviour. At least, nothing beyond acting out for attention. Back then, I was merely a child yearning for more attention from my overworked parents. I knew no better. Unfortunately for me, the doctor my parents took me to believed he had an answer to my desperate behaviour. ADHD, or better known as Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, or so the man explained. I was then prescribed pills, which I had to take each morning before school. I ceased fighting and often slept during class, but my parents were grateful that they made looking after me a bit less arduous. Nevertheless, I would already developed a reputation with the other parents and was therefore banned from everyone's house. In other words, I had no friends anymore. I don't think that this particular reason was behind my parents' decision to move, but it was my best guess at the time. My parents were middle class workers and therefore frugal when choosing the house. It was located out in the country with a rather luscious lawn, almost endemic to the yard. The house itself was allocated in the centre of this emerald grassland. Clearly it needed yard work, but to me it was a jungle of opportunities. I remember spending that first day hunting down insects and lizards, as well as any other creature I'd notice, during my cursory scan of the overgrown yard. The house itself was quaint and had no basement. Our beds didn't arrive for a few days, so until then I slept in my parents' room. I must admit, I miss those innocuous nights. They were the only calm ones I had back then. It wasn't until a few nights after my bed arrived that I noticed the erratic sounds. They began quietly at first, and I was able to ignore it for the time being. I imagined it to be some creature living within the walls, perhaps a lizard or a squirrel. However, it didn't take long for them to become difficult to ignore. The sounds became thumps, and on occasion I could swear I heard someone mumbling. With no reason to believe any different, I continued to ignore them up until the footsteps. At this point, my room was still empty beyond the single twin-sized bed, the head of which leaned against the wall. The source of the steps seemed to originate at the far wall opposite of me. I remember huddling in my bed, uncertain of how I should handle it. The footsteps were getting closer and seemed to be directed towards me, yet no other being was revealed as the culprit. The thought of this invisible entity somehow taking hold of me was enough to find my voice. The sound stopped as soon as my parents burst into the room. I promptly explained the noises and was about to mention the footsteps before they interrupted me. They blamed it on my lavish imagination, said it was all in my head and repeated this in order to lull me into a sense of security. As a child, I took their words to heart 
and let their explanations cocoon me in a blanket of ignorance. I didn't hear the sounds again that night, or for the next few nights, and by the first day of school, I chalked it up to a bad dream. I promptly took my morning pill and made my way to the bus stop. At the corner by the end of the road, I met my first friend, Tommy Sears. He was cool and welcomed me to the neighbourhood. We sat next to each other on the bus and he introduced me to a few other kids. All in all, it was a great first day. Once I got dropped off, I asked where he lived in case we'd be able to play over the weekend. He pointed up the road, to the right of where my new house was. His home was at least a mile away from my own, the view barred by the scattered plots of trees that littered the pastures and valleys. I should probably explain that the neighbourhood wasn't very close-knit. Each house was a mile or so apart and obscured by farms, trees and pasture. His particular house was also hidden by a wall of forested patches. We said our goodbyes and I mentioned my new friend to my parents who approved of my new social life. By that night, I felt none of my inane fear from before. That didn't last long. The sound started again, this time more prominent. The murmurs, though indecipherable, were louder. They fell silent once the thumping began. At first, it had a rhythm that slowly arose into a cacophony of muted noise. Eventually, the footsteps started again, once more directed towards me. The joys of the day drained from my conscious mind as fear overtook me. I tried to remember what my parents convinced me of, that this was all simply part of my vivid imagination. However, that didn't work for long, when a blood-curdling scream pierced the darkness. I, in turn, screamed in unison, once more calling my parents. Silence fell. It was as though my parents' presence was enough to scare whatever it was away. I was explicit this time, recounting every sound I'd heard since the first night. However, my insufferable parents refused to listen. Once more, they tried to coo lies of ignorance. Once more, they ignored my pleas. It turned into an argument. Eventually, they threatened to ground me and left me alone in the darkness of my room. It was at that moment I had an epiphany. My parents couldn't help me. No, they wouldn't help me. The next day at school, I confided in my new friend. I didn't originally plan to go into strict detail and began with a vague description of the sounds, ending my explanation with, but you know, it could just be a squirrel or something living in the walls. We did just move in after all. I expected him to make fun of me, possibly agree with the animal theory, Instead, he looked serious. That's exactly what the last kid was talking about, Tom mumbled. Who? I asked, excited to get a possible explanation, yet fearful of what he may say. Tom faced me with what looked like fear in his eyes. I heard about a boy who used to live up in that house years ago. He disappeared and his parents ended up moving away with his sister. Up until then, though, everyone said he complained about footsteps in his room. Only in his room. According to my sister, his room was the one on the opposite side of the house from the living room. She said she'd been there before, when the county was renovating it. My blood ran cold. He was talking about my room. I was afraid, but continued to question him for the rest of the lunch hour. 
by the time I arrived home, I'd come to a revelation. A family of four had lived in the house before us. Their son used to have the same room as mine and complained about footsteps every night before he disappeared. Before that, people in town speculated that the house was haunted by the first owners, who'd been brutally murdered in that room one night. Naturally, I asked my parents, but they merely shrugged it off and refused to look into the matter. It was frustrating, yet understandable. They never even bothered to watch television, let alone look into local rumours. A few nights after that, the sounds started again. They seemed rather distinct this time. I was frightened, but as I lay there in my bed, prepared for the footsteps I'd come to expect, I resolved myself to not include my parents. Just as expected, the footsteps started. As they reached my bed once more, I braced myself for some unknown force. Instead, I heard another scream. This one was just as blood-curdling as the first one, yet higher pitched and guttural. I covered my ears to block it out, but it did little to help. Then suddenly, it stopped as though it was cut short. I listened intently for any further sounds, but none came for the rest of the night. After that experience, I came to learn that this thing could not cause harm. Rather, it was just there to frighten me. After a month, I became immune to the sounds. I got a fan to drown out the quieter ones and would no longer bolt up in my bed at the screams. As expected, my parents never heard any of it. Another month went by and I'd developed a bond with Tom. He and I would explore the fields, trade scary stories, and make theories about what the ghost wanted from me. He seemed intrigued by the supernatural, and showed me what he called the ghost truck at the edge of a nearby pasture. According to him, it would drive away of its own accord on random nights, and reappear with blood on its seats. None of this was proven, though we did talk about someday camping out in the pasture to spy on it to see if it moved. We never did. Months went by. The sounds and the footsteps gradually began to decrease in frequency. Originally, I'd hear them three to five times per week, but now, they only occurred at random intervals. Not that I was complaining. Nonetheless, I never let Tom spend the night. I only ever went to his place. Luckily, my parents never questioned this. After a year, the sound stopped altogether, and my parents had finally saved up enough money so they could choose to buy a new house. Needless to say, I was relieved. We ended up moving to the other end of town. I'd have to get a ride from Tom's parents in order to visit him outside of school from now on, but that was fine by me. Years have passed, and I've all since forgotten about that room. Tom and I still get in touch. We're both attending the same high school now, and every now and then, we drift back onto the subject of the supernatural. I plan on getting my own apartment once I'm old enough. You may be wondering why I've bothered to tell you any of this. Well, there is a reason. About a month ago, the house was being prepped for another renovation. We'd been moved out for years, and my parents still never bothered to watch the news. I did. What I learnt was disturbing. Our old house is now closed to the public, and it's under investigation. While the renovators were trying to remove a dead animal from under the house, they'd stumbled upon a cellar 
that was blocked off by a board disguised as part of the outer wall. This cellar was small, but deep enough for standing room. Inside, they found butcher knives, axes, hooks, and a mass quantity of blood. Upon further investigation, I discovered that around that time I was living in that house, there was a large number of missing children from the nearby counties. The missing children's reports went back to before I ever moved in, and included a young boy around the same age who'd once lived there too. Naturally, I wanted to look further into this, and I asked Tom what he'd learned. Aside from the fact that the ghost truck had been missing ever since the sounds in that room ceased, I learned something even more frightening. The small cellar was found just under my room. <laughs> 